This is Cruise Radio. I cruise a lot and I always sail with travel insurance. You should too. Get a free quote today at tripinsurance.com. Broadcasting from the tripinsurance.com studios in Jacksonville, Florida. This is Cruise Radio. Hey, how's it going? My name is Doug Parker. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of Cruise Radio. Very happy to have you here, my friend. A review of Royal Caribbean's Harmony of the Seas this week and staff writer Richard Sims on deck with Cruise News. Hey, Richard. Hey, Doug. So we kick things off with a new high-flying attraction being rolled out by MSC. This is fascinating to me. I mean, we've seen roller coasters. We've seen, you know, sky gliders. Um, They're constantly coming up with new concepts. Well, now we have a swing. This one is called Cliffhanger, and it's basically two swings, each of which holds two people, that is on the top deck. And it will swing people out about 160 feet above the water. It's being introduced on MSC World's America, which, by the way, World of America, what an odd name. But anyway, it, it launches, the ship will launch in April of 2025, and this will, of course, be a big attraction when it launches. The ship is going to feature seven districts, which is basically the exact same concept we've seen on Carnival and Royal. They're just, you know, and, the, and a lot of the districts are exactly what was already on some of their previous ships. Uh, it just, they're calling it a district now. Um, this particular attraction will be found in the Family Adventure District. The ship, which will be sailing out of Miami, can carry about 6,700 people, which is a lot of folks trying to get on this ride that only holds four people at a time, max. I think there's no word yet whether or not this will be a free attraction or people will have to pay a fee to ride it. Now, if you do have to pay a fee, that could, of course, significantly cut down on, you know, the wait time that you have as far, because a lot of people might be like, no, I'm not going to pay to ride it. But clearly, this is something that all of the cruise lines are investing in. They're spending big bucks on these top deck attractions, which, I mean, I, I, I kind of assume they are designed to attract media attention, which they do. We're talking about it. And maybe new to cruisers. I don't think most, like, longtime cruisers are going to get it on a ship because it has a swing on it. But I think that, you know, it is something that might, if you're on the fence and you're thinking about cruising, you might be like, okay, that's kind of cool. That's high tech. I, let's give that a try. But I don't know. I'm I'm not sure how I feel about this one. And the latest man overboard story is truly a sad one. Yeah, these stories are never fun to report, especially since when someone goes overboard, there is very rarely a happy ending. And this is no exception. But it's even worse than most of those because – So it appears that a 20-year-old jumped off of Royal Caribbean's Liberty of the Seas in front of his father and brother. And that just that just hurts my heart. The thought of, you know, seeing that happen. It's bad enough when you know something happened, but to witness it. I guess it was the final day of the cruise. And according to witnesses, the young man's father was taking him to task for being intoxicated. And the son responded by saying something to the effect of, well, I'll fix this right now. And then he jumped overboard. So not only did they watch, but this poor father, that's his last interaction with his son. You know, his son being annoyed and jumping overboard because he was taking him to task for being drunk. One question that's been raised since this incident occurred is, how a 20-year-old was able to get that intoxicated. You know, it's one thing for maybe somebody to slip you a drink or something, but this person was intoxicated enough to behave this way, get, you know, and, and react to his father by jumping overboard. The drinking age on board, because it was a Caribbean cruise, would have, by Royal Caribbean's own policy, have been 21. So you can bet there are going to be some questions asked as the investigation into this incident continues. Mm. And I know how excited you get anytime Hollywood meets a cruise ship. Well, especially lately, pretty sure that someone at Carnival Corporation has tapped directly into my brain when they started <laughs> thinking about godparents. Um, you know, the godparents of late, they have really started looking for celebrities to do this. And not just Carnival, but, you know, um, a lot of lines. But a-, a week or two ago, they announced that Jonathan Bennett, who I've been a fan of since his days on All My Children, but most people probably know him from more recent stuff like Mean Girls, that he was picked to be the godfather of Carnival Forense. So I was already excited about that. But then Princess, which is a division of Carnival, announced 
that Hannah Waddingham is going to be the Sun Princess's godmother. Most people are going to know this English actress and singer from Ted Lasso because she starred on that as Rebecca Welton, the owner of the AFC Richmond soccer team the whole show revolved around. If you haven't, you should check the show out because she's charming. Ted Lasso is charming. The whole show is charming. Um, it's, but she's also, I'm hoping that at like the, the ceremony involved in the naming, she will sing because she has an absolutely gorgeous voice. She's very well known in England for, um, working the stage. Um, she's, she's got a recording career over there, but like I said, here, she's pretty much only known for Ted Lasso. Um, the ship's been in service since February, but the naming ceremony will actually take place in April during a port stop in Barcelona that's part of its 10-day sailing. So, you know, very excited for Sun Princess and for Anna Waddingham. She's a great choice. A cruise passenger still missing at the time of recording uh, down in Cozumel. Another sad story. Um, this time, the passenger in question didn't go overboard, but instead vanished during a stop in Cozumel. Edmund Bradley Solomon, um, who goes by Brad, he's a 66-year-old nurse who suffers from the onset of dementia. He disembarked from Icon of the Seas in Cozumel on April 3rd and didn't return to the ship. And they have been searching for him since. There have been numerous false leads. There's been a GoFundMe page set up um, for people who want to help pay for the search. His family has flown down there to try and help locate him. Honestly, it is my fondest hope that by the time this segment airs, he's been located. I'd rather we be reporting old news than that this family continues to wonder where their missing loved one is, or worse, that the story has the kind of tragic ending which seems almost inevitable as more and more time passes. You know, um, uh, the, the people are being encouraged if they happen to be in Cozumel and they happen to spot the man and you can find Photos and an actual special news report, which, by the way, Doug, you did a great job on that, uh, on the YouTube channel. Um, if you happen to be heading to Cozumel, check out the video, see see what this guy looks like in case somehow you actually wind up being able to you, you spot him and you can help in the search. They're asking people in the area, if they see him, to contact the local version of 911 or the authorities in Cozumel. But, you know, really hoping that this family gets uh, a a good resolution to this story. Very strange timing, Richard. His his daughter, um, the man whose daughter is Miss or And an MSC <laughs> ship was held in the port of Barcelona for two days for a rather unusual reason. You know, it's not all that uncommon to hear about someone using a fake passport or visa to try and travel to another country. But in this case... It is unusual. The MSC Armonia had her itinerary delayed for two full days while immigration officials tried to deal with nearly 70 guests on board who had falsified visas. Diplomats got involved and there were questions as to how this happened and whether the cruise line itself had any responsibility. MSC says the, the passports were checked before they boarded and they seemed to comply with all the necessary requirements to the various stops that they were going to be making on this itinerary. Family members of those um, who were found to have the false documents seem to think that the travel agency which issued them might be responsible. We don't know how that will turn out yet. We don't know exactly who will turn out to be um, responsible. We do know the ship eventually was able to, on Thursday, set sail. The delay led to the next sailing being canceled. We spoke to one person who was expecting to sail, and they got an email about the cancellation. But, of course, by the time they got that, They'd already traveled to the embarkation port, which in this case was Italy. <laughs> so, you know, so it's kind of a little late to be finding out. Not they could have told them sooner because they didn't know how long they'd be delayed. MSC is giving the passengers who were on this canceled cruise a full refund and a 50% future cruise credit. And we'll have to wait and see exactly, you know, who turned out to be to blame for these passengers not having the proper documentation. I have to say, I read one of the emails that MSC sent, and we've talked before about the fact that MSC is um, a line that is not, they're, they're not necessarily um, a 
thrust into some of the Americanized ways. And the email was very much like that. When you see emails from, say, Carnival or Norwegian and they're canceling cruises, they're like, oh, my God, we're so sorry. You know, we know this is a major inconvenience. MSC's email is very cut and dry. It's like, yeah, your cruise has been canceled. <laughs> it's, it's completely different than what we're used to seeing in the United States. And that's sort of a culture thing too, right? Like we hear that a lot when people do reviews on the show that the service is very matter of fact, but it really is just a European thing. They're not being rude. You know, going to a, a cafe here in the US or going to one in Rome, two different experiences for sure. Very much so. Yeah. Jewelry lovers will have, I can't believe we're doing this story. Jewelry lovers will have a new way to shop for jewelry on Carnival Forense. Why did you include this? Because I'm fascinated by this. So Effie, which is apparently really popular. It's so popular that they have stores on all 27 of Carnival's ships. And, you know, normally you go into a jewelry store and you try on your rings and, you know, you make your purchases, whatever. Well, guests on the Forense, and I assume this will spread out to the other ships in the fleet, they will be able to use the kiosk. So basically you go up to the kiosk and you scan your hand. And then they use virtual reality so that they take the image of your hand and they can, you know, you pick a ring from the display that you want to see and it lets you see what it'll look like on your hand. Now, I know what you're thinking, Doug. You're thinking, well, why wouldn't I just go up to the counter and try on the real ring? Mm -hmm. Well, because that's so time consuming. Why do that when you can go to a kiosk and do it? Um, Carnival says that this will save them, you know, that this will save passengers time, that they can you know, sort of just just stand there and try on a whole bunch of rings as opposed to waiting for the person behind the counter to get each ring. And then I guess you narrow down which ring you want and you say, oh, you know, can I try this one on? The one thing that I do kind of get is when you go into a ring store, I mean, I've never tried on rings, but my understanding is, you know, you go in and you try it on and it's not going to be fitted. So, it, you know, it's going to be a different size unless they happen to have your size. Whereas the virtual reality lets you see see what a fitted ring will look like. Maybe that makes a difference. I don't know. But I just find this fascinating because to me, and I find this to be true of a lot of virtual reality and um, um, and artificial intelligence, it feels much less personal than mm -hmm. the than the, the regular jewelry shopping experience. To me, like interacting with somebody and trying things on and looking in a mirror and asking your friends how they look, that would seem to be a big part of the experience. But here, they're going to make it easy. So Quote, it, unquote, easier. <laughs> okay, so it's like, you know, with Amazon, like, for instance, I'm redoing my studio right now, and I'm putting new panelings and lighting ups and stuff. And so I took a picture of my empty studio, and I could actually see what the panels look like on the walls and all this stuff without even buying them. So kind of the same thing. To me, that makes more sense, uh -huh. you know, because otherwise you would have to go to the store, get a bunch of different panels, hold them up, see how it looks, whatever. But, and, and that's not... You know, that's that's not something anybody wants to waste their time doing. But like I said, jewelry shopping seems so completely different to me. Like jewelry shopping, you want to try it on. You want to look at all the different ones. You want to like do that thing where you hold your hand out and look at it in the light. And mm -hmm. so I don't know. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if this is, you know, if this proves popular and they decide to roll it out to the rest of the fleet. All right. Staff writer Richard Sims, as always. Thank you, my friend. See you next week. As always, you're welcome. See you next week. <laughs> Have a question or a comment for the show? Yeah! Send an email or voice memo to Doug at CruiseRadio.net. A big question we get at Cruise Radio is, how do I know if I need trip insurance? Simple answer. If you're getting on a plane, taking a road trip, or getting on a cruise ship, you need to have travel insurance. Hey, it's Doug Parker from my friends at TripInsurance.com. Not, not only does TripInsurance.com protect your vacation investment, but it also gives you peace of mind in case anything were to go wrong on your trip. How do they do it? They offer three different types of trip insurance policies. Good, better, and best. One policy for every vacation budget. But it doesn't just stop there. They're up to 40% lower when you shop around on other comparison sites. Plus, TripInsurance.com offers 24-hour customer support support before, during, and after your trip, online claims assistance, and travel alerts to let you know what's going on at your destination. But find out for yourself. Check out tripinsurance.com. The world is constantly changing. Your place for news is still the same. 
online and on demand at cruiseradio.net. Michael and his wife just returned from a seven-night Western Caribbean cruise on Royal Caribbean's Harmony of the Seas, and he joins us on the line. How you doing, buddy? Hello, Doug. How you doing today? Very good. I'm excited to hear about Harmony. It's been a minute since uh, we've talked about this ship on the podcast. So before we get there, we're going to take a step back like we always do. You're up in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, what made you want to take this seven-nighter out of Texas? Uh, yeah, funny enough, we actually had uh, a Norwegian Prima book. And uh, we came back off of doing Mardi Gras and we heard that uh, Harmony was going to be in uh, Galveston area. And that's a drive in about eight, well, about 10 hour drive from our house. And we're like, well, let's just go ahead and switch it over to that. And, you know, no, no shame to Norwegian or anything. It was just something that we've already done. We've done Oasis of the Sea. So we thought, well, let's try Harmony and see how that goes. You mentioned it was about eight to 10 hours to get from Wichita down to the Gulf Coast there. Uh, if you're going to fly against driving, is one better than the other? Because like for here, if you're going to take a, a car ride, um, sometimes the airport is just about as long as the car ride itself. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because uh, I sort of like to drive down there. I think I like making a day of it type thing. But I think it's equally uh, feasible to fly, yeah. you know, so what we typically do is we grab a rent a car from Wichita, the airport, and then, you know, drive on down and uh, drop it off in a, a town called, I think it's called Marquette or mm -hmm. Lamarck, excuse me, Lamarck, Texas. And they have an Avis there that we usually drop it off. And then we just Uber to the cruise port. Uh, this time, actually, though, our, you know, we did some pre cruise time in Dallas. So we stopped in Dallas one night and then the following time we just traveled on into Houston and Galveston area. Did you hang out pre cruise in Galveston at all? Uh, you know, we were it's funny enough. We In Dallas, we went to a restaurant they have there now called uh, Coco Ichiban, mm -hmm. Ichibanya, which is a, a Japanese restaurant. Both me and my wife were stationed overseas in Japan for a while. Nice. So um, they opened one up in Dallas. And we're like, well, we got to try it. So when we went on this cruise, we were like, this is the perfect time to do it. We'll just stay there in uh, it's Frisco, Texas, north of, north of Dallas there. We stayed there one night, and then we drove on down. I was going to stop by and see my dad, but he had some things going on, uh, some previous engagements. So then I said, well, let's go to, uh, what's that, Kima Boardwalk. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever been there. Years ago. Okay. So we were going to stop by there. It was uh, That was on a Saturday, but it, the traffic was just so ridiculous, and there was no parking, so we said forget about it, and we just – uh, went to our hotel in uh, Texas City, which is across from Lamar. It's amazing how bad traffic can get there. When I was leaving there the other day, I think it was like two weeks ago, maybe. Um, it uh -huh. was insane. Like, just we were trying to actually get to the boardwalk and we could get anywhere close to it. So we're like, OK, let's just head to Houston and fly out. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty much the same thing. And matter of fact, I, I said, let's come back later on, like seven o'clock and see if mm -hmm. traffic's any better. And it was actually worse. Oh, so wow. we're, we just turned back around and went and grabbed something to eat and went back to our hotel and just you know, woke up the next morning to go to the cruise. This is like around five o'clock or so. It was, it was pretty, uh, pretty nasty with the traffic wise. So you make your way to the Royal Caribbean terminal, which is brand new down there in Galveston on Harmony of the Seas. How was your embarkation process and how long did it take you to get from the curb to the ship? Uh, yeah, it's sort of funny because I've sailed out of here twice. And in my honest opinion, Royal is so fast with getting you on the ship that you don't even get to look at this brand new terminal that you spent millions of dollars on. <laughs> so every time I go there, I'm like, well, I didn't really get to see the terminal. <laughs> so um, curb the ship. I, if it was more than 10 minutes, I'd be surprised. One thing I, I found interesting that they're doing now is that they have like this consolidated area uh, to drop your bags off. And then the porters stand behind the line and there's just one guy that sort of, you know, checks your uh, tag and everything and then hands it off to the porters. Um, didn't particularly like that because I didn't get a chance to really tip the porters that took my bag. I wanted to actually tip them. But other than that, it's very efficient. Like everybody just goes through the same line. You mentioned that you've sailed an Oasis class ship before. So what were your first impressions when you boarded this one? You know, obviously, you know, very similar and familiar. Um, and one interesting thing about Harmony, I, I sort of noticed after sailing Oasis, is like it, it, you sort of look for like little things that are missing or are dilapidated or whatever. And honestly, I just couldn't find anything on this ship. It, it seemed like they really keep this ship up well. It was just yes. something I just started noticing. Like, man, this ship really looks great. You know, throughout it looks good everywhere. Our stateroom looked great. Uh, pool deck looked great. One interesting thing was the. Um, like the first five days, I think, of the sailing, the uh, splash pad, or I forgot what it's called on that ship, splash line or whatever, it was actually closed down because they were resurfacing it. Hmm. Um, and I don't think that opened to like day five or day six. 
You know, it's funny you say that. I was actually just talking to a friend who works at one of the shipyards in Europe, and he was telling me mm-hmm. that they they replace the flooring in the splash pads like every couple of years. I didn't realize they wore out so fast. Yeah, it's so funny. I did not realize they wore out so fast either. And, you know, when we got on the ship, I was looking at it I was like, well, it doesn't really look that bad. But I'm assuming after sanding and everything, I, I'm not sure what mm-hmm. the original condition looked like. Once they were done, it looked great. And they started filling up with water and kids were having a good old time. Yeah, I guess that water logging probably does uh, probably does quite a number on it too every day for 365. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, what kind of stateroom did you book on this seven night cruise and what did you think of it throughout the week? We actually had the regular ocean view balcony. Um, I just didn't take a shot. Usually, funny enough, I, I when I usually use Royal Up just for, you know, just figure I can get something better. Like one time I had a, a uh, junior suite and one time it was an interior um casino crews and they upgraded me to a balcony but this time i just said you know i'm just gonna be fine with what we got and it it was perfectly fine it was on the port side towards the front um, my wife does suffer from seasickness but she didn't really have an issue with it being at the front of the ship so it worked out great and it looked you know like i said everything looked there was nothing in disrepair it looked like a great state room and we enjoyed it did you have any noise issues either top or bottom or left or right uh no funny enough i you know, and I'm not a rookie per se, but I'm relatively new to cruising, but I did have the hanger issue. Like my hangers were clanking <laughs> and it took me a second. I was like, well, what is that? You know, like, why is it making a noise? And then I was like, well, maybe it's the hanger. So one day I just pulled them out and laid them down in the bottom of the thing. You know, that we never had an issue from there on. Other than that, the occasional slamming of the door by the neighbors and that was it. We really didn't have any noise issues. And we were on deck 11, by the way. So okay. that, you know, that's state rooms below and up above. So it's Sure. Uh, as as far as the dining goes, how were how were the meals in the Lido? Uh, was it called the? Uh, how were the meals in the Windjammer Marketplace and the food selection and all that throughout the week? We actually only ate in the uh, Windjammer one time. Uh, boarding day was ram jam with people. Uh, I think we tried to catch lunch there one time and it was just super packed. Uh, so the only time we went was for dinner uh, one time, and it, you know it was, you know decent food, but it, yeah. It, other than the, you know, dinner, you're it's going to be pretty crowded. I think, you know, you might want to look for somewhere else to go unless you get there early or late. Yeah, gotcha. And then outside of that, of course, you have uh, plenty of options that are included in the price of your food talk, or in price of your fare, rather. Talk to us about some of those. We did uh, main dining room, I want to say twice, and it was excellent. Uh, we had great, great servers and, you know. We were sat off close. One time we actually got a window seat because we were my time dining. We were sat close to the window one time and then the other time it was just uh, just interior of the window. And it was it was a great experience, great wait staff and everything like that. And the other uh, nights we did, we mostly did specialty dining. I think four out of the seven nights we did specialty dining. Okay, so talk to us about some of the specialty restaurants you went to and maybe a, maybe a highlight from each one. First one we did was Wonderland. That was actually my first time going there. And I will say that I hear people sort of like, who poo it sometimes because the food is just sort of uh, unique, I guess you would say. So it's like, you know, they also don't bring kids or whatever, but uh, we really enjoyed it. My wife loved it. And uh, we sort of just um, had the usual, like the eggs that they do in the bird's nest, uh, the crazy dessert. But it, it, yeah, we really thought it was really good. I would actually do it again. Then we did, uh, we skipped Azumi because we actually did the sushi class, which is something I really recommend if you've never done it. Um, they really do have a great sushi class. It's fun. Um, and then you can't take any of the stuff with you. So you have to eat it there. And after we got done eating that, we had a Zumi book and I was like, well, we might as well just cancel that. Cause we basically just ate a Zumi, especially since I made it and I'm a professional. So, <laughs> so, uh, after that, we just changed over to, I think we went, um, changed it to 150, uh, central park. That was great. Uh, we, we basically rolled out of there that our waiter just fed us over and over again. It was amazing. And uh, obviously, we had to try Sabor. My wife loves Mexican food, so we tried Sabor, and we really, really, really liked that. How about like going down through the Promenade uh, Park Cafe or Sabaros? Oh, not Sabaros. <laughs> what is it called? The pizza place? <laughs> uh, Sorrento's. Yeah. Yes. I told yeah, you it was my Sorrento's. last one, man. <laughs> how was how was Sorrento's? <laughs> it, it was good. I, I actually only had it like I think once or twice. Like a, uh, I think my wife grabbed a piece of pizza, and I ate a little bit of it. It tasted great. But yeah, like just from the eating at restaurants and whatnot, we were pretty stuffed throughout the day or whatever. But um, yeah, we had it a couple of times. It was great. And there was hardly any line there, to be honest with you. Okay. Very guys. Um, any Johnny Rockets? Uh, just for, for the first time, we had it for breakfast and it was really good. We liked it. It was, um, it, 
we got there right before the rush got there. There's quite a few people who started coming and asking for tables. So it, we got there in time, ate outside. It was fantastic. We, we, we liked it. How does that work? Is it comp for breakfast and they start charging for uh, lunch and dinner? Yeah, it's a uh, complimentary for breakfast on the Oasis and Quantum class ships. Mm-hmm. But uh, once you uh, go to lunch and dinner, I, I think I think it's cover charge. I don't think they charge uh, a la carte. I think it's still a cover charge. Gotcha. How was the entertainment on this seven night cruise? Um, Yeah, you know, uh, the first one we saw was the ice show. And that's comparable to most of your Oasis class and Quantum class ships that you see their ice shows on. It was pretty good. We liked it. And then uh, we saw Grease. My wife absolutely loved it. And I thought it was great, too. That was pretty fun to watch. And I guess it just puts you back in memory lane when you first saw the movie, really. The one sleeper that we watched was Columbus, which we both of us really enjoyed that. You know, a lot of covers from uh, different songs was set to that theme of uh, Christopher Columbus's fictional cousin who's a, mm-hmm. a flunky and goes and does his own thing. Um, yeah, I, I really didn't expect much for that, but we absolutely loved it. We had a good time with that. And then obviously the Aqua shows are always great. They're they're fantastic. Any like comedy or music around the ship you hit up? Unfortunately, we just, you know, never made it to the comedy show. And I, I think I've only been to one comedy show out of four or five cruises. And yeah. it's crazy. Like we always say we're going to go and we end up missing it because we just had, you know, we're just having fun and sure. doing whatever. Uh, but we absolutely wanted to go and we missed the comedy show. How was the, uh, as far as like the casino area with the smoke, I, I know that these, on these Oasis class ships, the casinos are down pretty low um, with the smoke situation mm-hmm. in and around the casino. I know they have, I guess the Oasis class ships do have that, what, non-smoking casino now? Yeah, they have the non-smoking casino across from the attic on uh, deck four, which gotcha. I, I think it used to be like the diamond uh, some type of diamond lounge or something they may have moved. I can't remember, to be honest with you. But yeah, they have a non-smoking casino there. Obviously, walking through the casino, I, I'm a former smoker, and um, smoke doesn't really bother me or my wife that much. Mm-hmm. But I did notice once I got back to my stateroom that my clothes absolutely smell like stale smoke. So obviously, I don't think it's like if your sense of this, uh, smoke smells, I wouldn't recommend going in there, but they do have the non-smoking casino. Gotcha. Uh, how were the sea days as far as crowds and congestion? I would honestly say nothing to complain about. I really never had an issue uh, getting elevators. Um, I got a bum hip right now I'm working on, so I am i wasn't trying to do the stair challenge for this mm-hmm. cruise at all. Um, so we actually waited for elevators. And, and I think there was only three times where I was like, oh, it's taking a little bit of time to get an elevator. Other than that, it was fine. And then, um, the you know, the usual uh, pool deck is you know, pretty packed and um, a lot of chairs taken up. But uh, in Cozumel, we didn't get off the ship. So we rented a casita on the pool deck. Mm-hmm. And that was really cool. Uh, there was hardly anybody on it. And I'm surprised because I thought, you know, a lot of people will probably stay on the ship because they, you know, a lot of people go to Cozumel a lot. But uh, we absolutely loved it, man. We just sat up there all day and our stateroom tenant took a, we had a drink package. So we just kept bringing us drinks all day long. And we just hung out and read, read our little candles and had a good time. How does that work? Can you get it for a day or a half day? Um, I think it's just a day. Okay. And on a, on a sea or excuse me, on a port day, I think it's like 109, I think it was $119 maybe. And then... On a sea day, I'm pretty sure it's, you can double that and some change. In my opinion, for a, a port day, like if you're going to Nassau and you don't plan on getting off, it's well worth it. Well, in speaking of ports, let's talk about the ports you hit on this. Seven Eye, what was up first? Well, uh, the first port was Roatan. The highlight, we went to Little French Key. Honestly, it was just being there. We had a we had a fantastic time. I did some snorkeling. Lost my Apple Watch, unfortunately. Had to erase that. Um, and then we went to like the, I think it's called Daniel Daniel Johnson's Sloth and Monkey Hangout or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, our tour guide uh, took us there afterwards and we, you know, got to hold sloths and hang out with the monkeys. It was really cool. We used a company, a third party company called Roatan Five Stars, and they actually had private transportation to and from. And I, we only paid like 200, maybe 200, uh, 290, maybe I don't even think it was 290, it's $270 for both of us, uh, with entrance into little French key with meal and four drinks and then the sloth hangout. Yeah. That little French key is really fun. I absolutely love it. It was beautiful. Yeah. I couldn't complain at all. There were some, there's some people there from a Norwegian ship that were just having a blast. I swear that waiter was going over to them every five minutes with a uh, uh, tray full of drinks and shots. I was like, man, they're going to have a rough night when they get back on that ship. <laughs> and someone's got them a new Apple Watch, too, I'm sure. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. If they got the courage to uh, go under and try and find it in, underneath that bridge, they can have it, I guess. <laughs> it wasn't the Ultra, was it? No, thank God. It's okay, just FE, thank God. And then where'd you go next? Uh, that was uh, close to Maya. Um, funny enough, we've never been there, but we still were, we just didn't feel like doing an excursion. So we sort of hung out in the port area and, uh, went and ate uh, lunch at that little restaurant next to the Dolphin exhibit there. I, don't, I can't remember the name of that restaurant, do you? I don't remember the name, but I've been there a couple of times. Affordable and a good view. Did that, did some souvenir shopping, and then made our way back to the ship. And then it was Cozumel. Uh, yes, Cozumel. We actually stayed on the ship and, and uh, did the casita. Um, and besides that, I don't think we did anything else uh, that day. And we definitely didn't hop off the ship and grab souvenirs or nothing. We were just fine with sort of hanging out on the ship. How many ships were in port with you at Costa Maya? Uh, Costa Maya, I want to say there was three. I think uh, Princess had a ship there. And then um, uh, Holland America had their ship there. And uh, we actually saw a pier runner because we were looking out the window and she was <laughs> running towards the ship. And she was very close to missing that ship. Wait, was it your ship? No, it was the Hall America ship. Wow. Okay, that would have been the last ship I would have thought. <laughs> yeah, I was really surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Costa Maya is one of those ports where if you only have one ship there, it's an absolute gem. But once you start putting in two, three and four, it gets chaotic very quickly. It was crowded. And it was. Yeah, I would I would say it was pretty uh, overwhelming. Like we were yeah. just happy to get to that restaurant and sit down and get away from some people. All right. You get back to Galveston. It's time to get off the ship. How does Royal Caribbean do it like Carnival does the digital debark now along the same lines? Uh, they still, um, you check in on the app and tell them what your plans are and, uh, they'll give you a, your luggage tags if you want, if you're not doing self-assist. Mm -hmm. Um, this is the first time we didn't do self-assist getting off a cruise and, uh, it wasn't that bad. Um, we had to go wait in the, our waiting area was in the Royal theater. So we just waited there. It's the only bad thing about it is like people just come in there and sit at the very end of the rows. So there's not a lot of seating room because all the seat, all the open seats are in the middle. Yeah. So the people are on the outskirts. So that's the only unfortunate thing about having it in theater. But um, I think our call time was around uh, 9, 20 or so, because I told them I wasn't catching a flight. I was just driving. So mm -hmm. I had a late time to get off. And yeah, it was fine. And then uh, when you go through the port, if, as long as you have a passport or check in with a passport, it just does facial recognition. and You're on your way. I didn't ask you earlier, but did you have any dining plans on this cruise, like any pre-purchased dining? Yeah, I, I purchased the uh, three-night dining. When you're purchasing a dining package like that, how exactly does that work? Like, are you having to make these reservations before you get on the ship, or can you do it once on board? Yeah, it's sort of strange the way they do it. They they have you go into the app, like when you purchase it, and they have you select a day, just a placeholder, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then once you get on the actual ship, you will go to like any of the specialty dining or that I think they have like a little kiosk and a promenade on uh, the embarkation day. And you'll just go in and make your reservations. And it was pretty cool because I, because I had a dining package. The guy that was taking my uh, reservations, he said, Hey, cause we wanted to go to Sabor cause my wife loves Mexican food. So when I said that, he goes, you sure you want to do that for Sabor? Because he, he's like, Hey, you got a diamond, pa dine, you know, dining package. You might as well just pay for Sabor out of pocket. And, and I was like, yeah, that's actually a good idea. I don't mind doing another night of, specialty dining. So nice. they're pretty attentive. And then, you know, they know when you're trying to give you the best for your money. Do you have any first time tips to offer anyone uh, sailing Harmony of the Seas or going down to the Western Caribbean? You know, I don't want to be cliche, but I, if you haven't been on Harmony, you know, definitely see the shows. I've been on the Oasis class ship before, but the, the shows still wow me. You know what I mean? So it's just something that you definitely want to do is see the shows. Um, God, there's just so much to do, but don't, you know, obviously don't try to stuff everything into one day or into one cruise. Mm -hmm. If you don't get it all done, just come back and do it again. It's, a, it's just an excuse to take another cruise. Really. <laughs> That's the attitude. What was the biggest highlight of this cruise for y'all? You know, honestly, I, I, I want to say it was probably Roatan and cause we had never been there before. It was, it was just a, it's a beautiful Island. So it was cool to go there and just see, see what it's like. And the water is absolutely stunning. So, yeah, I definitely would go back there. Um, that was definitely a highlight for us. And to put a giant bow on this interview, your final thoughts of Harmony of the Seas. Worth every penny. Um, it's a great ship. It's kept, it's kept in great condition. The crew is amazing. I mean, I, I didn't have a, a single bad experience. Um, I never saw anybody who was agitated or aggravated with crew that you usually find sometimes on cruise ships. So it just seemed like a, it was either the perfect sailing or just things are all in line, but it, it was great. We had a great time. 
We've been speaking with Michael about his seven-night cruise aboard Royal Caribbean's Harmony of the Seas down to the Western Caribbean from Texas. Thank you so much for stopping by and sharing your experience. Oh, thanks for having me, Doug. I really appreciate it. All right, Dougie, let's see what we got for you, buddy. Cruise Radio is produced at the TripInsurance.com studios in Jacksonville, Florida. Get cruise news, ship reviews, and money-saving tips every Thursday on Cruise Radio. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show. If you want to help spread the word, give Cruise Radio a five-star review. Find Cruise Radio where you listen to your favorite podcast or online at cruiseradio.net. I'm your announcer.